Welcome to URI and this evening's landscape lecture. We'll be getting underway shortly, but before we do, I'd like to bring you a short video highlighting our college, the College of Arts and Sciences. Nobody is going to ever, ever replace the capacity of a human. And this is why thinking is our number one obsession. What's great about URI, especially in arts and sciences, we're a liberal arts college within a bigger school. And so you get that liberal arts feel, but you also get the ability to do research. We, as the flagship school of our state, do cutting edge work. You have to really look at schools as a place to grow as yourself. You're not going to be handheld anymore. This is a time for you to really delve into yourself and find what you like. It needs to be somewhere that you're going to find to be a home, but also a place to build yourself. And I think that URI does a great job of that. Students learn when they engage and get their own hands in that material. You're going to construct knowledge. You're going to do research. That's what creates transformative experiences. That's what creates people who are passionate about learning. Rather than simply acquiring a body of knowledge, they themselves are developing in a way that keeps them agile, constantly able to re-educate themselves, constantly able to think critically, to adapt to new ways of learning, new ways of thinking, and to keep evolving throughout the course of a life. Undergraduate liberal arts education is so transformative to the mind, to who you are. The humanities and the arts are there to help you explore the fringes of what's possible. And understanding how you can look at the world in new and different ways and be ready whenever changes happen. Multiculturalism and multidisciplinarity are very important because it gives you a unique perspective. You see students are actually excited to see people that think about problems from a different perspective. Problem solving can be attacked from different point of view. It's nice to be able to come to a school where there's like so many different narratives, so many different perspectives. There's a place for everybody. I think really what URI has to offer is the people and the opportunities. The people around you, they're all going to help you grow in ways that you've never understood before. I think there's a lot of people, students in particular, that are just excited that whatever field they're in, they want to be the best at it. There's a sense of you know, pride in the work that you put out there. And I think that's, that's kind of infectious. The College of Arts and Sciences education gives you the confidence to bring together all the strands that you value and apply them in ways that are fulfilling for you as an individual, but also resonate out. The thing that sets URI apart is that we as a faculty and as an institution ask our students not just what you can do, but who can you be. We're a small place, there's no denying that. I kind of think we're like a best kept secret. Good evening. I'm Will Green. I'm the chair of the Department of Landscape Architecture at the University of Rhode Island. I want to welcome you to this, our third program in a year long series focused on the topic of activism, equity, and environmental justice. Before we begin, I would like to thank the individuals who work in the background and assist in making this series possible. They include Lisa Smolinski, our administrative assistant, our students, Lindsay Corsi and Miranda Yoon, both seniors, and assisting with this evening's program, and Leah Cooper of the Harrington School College of Arts and Sciences, who has helped us to produce and stream this series while also training our students 
for the work ahead. I also want to thank the sponsors of our lecture series. They include the College of Arts and Sciences, the University Libraries, the Department of Art and Art History, Department of Landscape Architecture, the Rhode Island Chapter of the American Society of Landscape Architects, Landscape Forms, and the GP Faella Endowment. Uh, in this, our 28th year, we are asking our students, our students, our speakers, to present on a very timely topic, landscape architecture, activism, equity, and environmental justice. And we are asking our guests to share with us and with you their practices, their methods, their strategies, and their thoughts. For a list of series speakers, you can go to the URI Landscape Architecture website. Our next guest will be here on November the 5th, and it will be Diana Fernandez, who is an associate with Sasaki Associates. The way the evening is going to work is that we are, I'm going to leave it to our guests to introduce themselves. Um, they are going to make, there will be three, three presentations and an introduction. And for our viewers, it's important to know that you can ask questions. There is a comments area to the right of your screen. And if you have question or you have comments, please write those down or type them in. And we will have students in the back uh, looking at them along with our guests. And um, we will select questions from those that we receive. This evening, we have a very special program that is coming to you live from South Africa, where it is midnight. I will begin by introducing Graham Young, who is a friend and an award-winning landscape architect, who is the convener for this program. Graham holds landscape architecture degrees from the University of Toronto and also from the University of Pretoria, where he um, had received his master's in landscape architecture. Graham has written widely. He's a professional landscape architect and he has spoken at international venues and at universities, including at Kingston in 2011. And he was brought here as, a, as an international scholar. He recently retired after an exciting 30 year academic career at the University of Pretoria, where his focus was on design and urban ecology. Today, he runs his own practice He's the Secretary General of the International Federation of Landscape Architects, IFLA Africa. He's a fellow of the Institute of Landscape Architects in South Africa and a registered member of the South Africa Council for the Landscape Architectural Profession. I would like to welcome my good friend, Graham Young. Well, thank you, Will, uh, for that uh, lovely introduction. And it's great to be in the realm of the UIR again. Uh, the last time I was in Rhode Island was as a guest of the University and the Landscape Architecture Department back in 2011, when I spent a lovely week lecturing and working in the studio with your students and also engineering and women's studies students. And again, uh, Will, you had arranged all of that and thank, thanks so much, and especially for inviting us to be part of this uh, um, uh, important series that you run every year. Uh, 28 years now, you've just said. Uh, that's wonderful. So our, um, our presentation then is entitled uh, um, Rethinking Heritage, Culture and Violence Prevention. Um, And one might um, subtitle it through landscape architecture. We have three extremely exciting and diverse presentations that deal with this theme in pragmatic and creative ways. And although we are in um, South Africa, right at the bottom of the world, one of the projects that we'll be talking about tonight is, comes from the Middle East in Afghanistan. Anthony Wayne will be our first presenter. 
Now, Anthony is the Director of Planning Partners at Cape Town-based Landscape Architecture and Planning Consultancy. He was trained in the UK and has 36 years experience in 21 countries worldwide. He is the Senior Consultant to the Aga Khan Trust for Culture, uh, that's their Historic Cities Program, and was the first Mellon resident practitioner in 2015 at Dumbarton Oaks, Washington, D.C. He has published and presented many anecdotal papers on his projects and spoken widely at conferences. Anthony will describe the process of restoring an ancient garden in the center of war-torn Kabul. This is one of his Aga Khan Trust for Culture projects. The second project will be presented by Lesejo Badseng. Now, Lesejo works at the South African government's Department of Public Works, where she is one of the resident landscape architects. She is also co-founder of Uhuru Heritage, an NPO geared to molding current and future societies. Her project completed as her master's thesis at the University of Cape Town, received the Corobrick Most Innovative Project Award in 2018. Lesejo's work draws on her Setswana cultural roots and indigenous knowledge systems to inform setabout making in the poor and environmentally degraded yet culturally rich rural parts of northwestern South Africa, a region that suffers from ill-conceived apartheid era planning. Our final presentation is by Tarna Klitzner. Tana is the principal of Tana Klitzner um, Landscape Architects located in Cape Town. She has a degree in architecture from the University of Cape Town and a master's degree in landscape architecture from the University of Pennsylvania. Tana's interests lie in the provision of equitable social and environmental interventions at various scales and, when, and within contrasting paradigms. She is also a passionate teacher and lectures at in the Landscape Architecture Master's Program at the University of Cape Town. Tana's presentation elaborates on the opportunity that landscape architecture and urban design offer in the creation of park spaces in the poor and crime-ridden communities of Kailicha near Cape Town. The purpose of these projects is to provide safe park space and pedestrian ways that reduce crime and prevent the violence so often associated with open spaces in South African township areas. These works are cutting edge and highlight how landscape architects, when they engage with the social fabric of places they are working in, can create successful projects in the often difficult and challenging places we are called to intervene in. Thank you. Anthony Wayne will now uh, start off the present, our presentations with his uh, work in Kabul, Afghanistan. Hello, I'm Anthony. Uh, my talk is entitled Jahil Satoon Gardens, a heritage public park in Kabul, Afghanistan. Occasionally, old landscape architects are reminded in a new place why they once dreamed of becoming a young landscape architect in the first place. So it was for me working in Kabul, Afghanistan. I and my small team were invited to consult to the Aga Khan Trust for Culture Historical City Support Group to work with their large design team in the revitalization of a rundown city park. Our story is a case study in extremists, but also a fairy tale a ruined king's palace with formal but overgrown gardens to be rapidly transformed into a place of pleasure and peace, physical exercise and civic energy. All in a once war-torn and still risky city. It's an unusual story to tell, but here goes. Kabul. Well, Kabul was once a city notable for politics, trade, culture and urban expression, including early Mughal gardens and later 20th century European style parks. Today, the Afghan population is 30 million and actually diminishing, but internally refugees flee to Kabul, the capital, making it the fifth fastest growing city in the world with a population of 3.6 million, roundabout New Zealand's population. 
The winter temperature low is minus 20 degrees centigrade. The summer high plus 40 degrees centigrade. And it's a challenging rain range for landscaping and even living. The Kabul River flows in summer from glaciers, so there's ample water, but its quality is often polluted, as is the air. And there are frequent earthquakes and explosions, and it's very, very dusty. Consequently, the average life expectancy of a man is only 60 years. So where does the hope linger? In a park, perhaps. A clean, green place of safety, a place of peace in the city's clamour, a place where the sight and scent of roses overwhelms the sight and scent of guns. The city itself literally vibrates with both urban and human activity. The crowding and chaos of everyday life, unimaginable traffic jams and non-stop informal trading begs the citizens and visitors to seek refuge in any park which offers sanctuary. Two parks merit distinction. The great Mughal pal uh, gardens and palaces of Bagi Babur at the top, laid out by the first Emperor Babur in around 1500, and Chilsatun uh, Gardens, an early 20th century palace and park of the Emir Habibullah Khan, there at the bottom of the picture. Both have followed the model of restoration project funding by overseas donations and working with AKTC and the Kabul municipality. They are supported after opening by a small entry fee and extra income from concessions, including events and different levels of food vending, a vital cultural key in this environment. Both gardens are now not simply restored, but transformed to welcome and accommodate the general public. They enable ordinary people, especially families, to find both peace and recreation and refuge in the organizing geometry of avenues and axial spaces, the deep shade of trees, and the light perfume of roses. Here we see the garden's uh, restored geometric pattern in plan, embedded in the surging city fabric. High curtain walls still protect the site and exclude traffic noise from these traditional Islamic fourfold gardens. They comprise clean walkways, green lawns, many trees, shady avenues, and orchards for fruit and blossom. A paradise compared to what lies beyond the wall. To thrive and succeed in a modern city, a park must embrace diversity and common courtesy. This heady mix of access control, music concerts, school group visits, a public swimming pool, and clean, green, efficient management illustrates the acceptance and value of this historic park to this urban community, heritage today and urban community today, uh, tomorrow. So to Shahil Satoon Gardens, our case study, a palace on a, uh, on a rocky outcrop wrapped in a well treed park of about 12.5 hectares, all held together by a crumbling curtain wall in a sea of unregulated urban growth. Literally a landscape palimpsest, not only to be restored, but revived and renewed. You can see the uh, geometry vaguely in the patterns of the trees. In terms of community acceptance, it's often beneficial to start from with the upgrading of the immediate external environment or landscape uh, to, a, to a park project. They become function, a functional connection to the new public landscape. Here, once destroyed terrace fruit orchards were replanted and furrow irrigation reinstated on derelict lands above the park uh, to actually create a sense of momentum to the community and excitement about what was going to happen in the park below their eyes. Equally, shared civic elements of stormwater, sewage and solid waste, basic things, needed urgent interventions and you couldn't really uplift the park without making actions uh, and inter interventions uh, immediately around in those services. Creating local employment is a vital element in the justification of such cultural heritage projects and smooths the road. Meanwhile, just beyond the park's boundary, the real world continued, whilst the old world fabric of the park was assessed, revived, recreated, or rethought. Once the turn of the, uh, the 20th century, uh, uh, once the turn of the 20th century Grand Palace with formal axial gardens, marble fountains, and waterways, after the Soviet occupation of 1979, it had become a place of urban warfare. 
Gunfire had raked and pitted the buildings and the marble and the green fabric of the park was shattered or burnt. You can see uh, all the bullet holes in the building in the top uh, right hand corner, but wonderful remnants remained. Some worthwhile evidence of physical human patterns or spaces remained and were retrieved. They suggested an optimistic renovation and adaptive reuse in a creative but cultural and civic manner. Even during reconstruction, opportunistic youths continued to play ball. Both conventional and innovative sports popped up everywhere within the actual confines of the park construction area, even in the ruins of grandeur the now defunct fountains you see in these pictures, now used for cricket, a very vital sport to the Afghans. Surprisingly, even some remnants of old fashioned shrub rose plantings had survived, survived everything, and were protected throughout the renovation, proving their resilience and continuing their cultural connection. Actually, the name Jahil Satoon means 40 pillars as evident in these period photographs. Forest and fountains defined this garden retreat for royalty and the ruling class. Its new future as the hub of a public path, a park, is both profound and exciting. By 2014, past urban warfare and time had reduced the park to, uh, to precious marble remnants and equally precious remnant cedars, blue pines, and the ever popular mulberries, which still fed the population when in fruit. However, however unlikely, the 100-year-old uh, gravity irrigation channels still ran straight and strong, even after all this time and all this disturbance. The water feature there in the uh, bottom right is actually an early 20th century example of a rim flow, rim flow pool, believe it or not. Extensive surveys of heritage, both personal, built and planted, were the backbone for restoration and the adaptive reuse policies used to craft an integrated landscape master plan for this site. A prolonged process, but done very carefully, uh, with a lot of uh, attention to what was actually uh, uh, conservation worthy and what was retrievable. The new park, now defined by a rebuilt curtain wall, also embraced external connections and urban functions. This is shown in the master plan where it bleeds out into the surrounding territory beyond the park itself. The existing structure, structure plantings of tree avenues and arboretum were planted and protected and reinforced. Additional tree plantings, including native species and fruit trees, repopulated the garden and created a now accessible park uh, accessible to the locals and to visitors of the city. Patterns of sports fields, heritage geometries and the discipline of gravity irrigation all came together geometrically, neatly in an innovative hybrid park form. And here you see examples of the old fabric of the uh, formal, formal flower beds, the formal uh, structure of the garden, and the sports fields, which are an essential, uh, essential uh, function in a park full of young people, in a city full of young people, in a country full of young people. Afghans make great gardeners and rose to the challenge of growing the majority of new plants for the project on site. They are now famous as the gardeners of Kabul and very proud. I in the picture just kept my head down looking for topsoil everywhere and there was at least two meters in many places, even under previous pavings so it was a wonderful place to garden in you had water you had plants and you now had topsoil the design team and craftsmen explored local skills and construction simply written in stone the idea was to work with the materials which were available on or near the site and restore and recreate old types of workmanship that still existed within the actual city itself. Unheard of levels of carpentry still existed and were still being taught to the youngsters in the vicinity. Traditional artisanal techniques in masonry had survived all destructions and found new relevance. They had even survived and avoided mechanization. Conspicuously, innovative masonry now also contributed to the construction of the new wall, rammed earth concrete reinforced with giant bamboo. 
it flexes slightly when there are tremors. It framed the extensive around the wall walkway so reminiscent of a cloister, half trees, half masonry, hard landscape and, south and soft landscape in a sort of design harmony. Many hands and many plans overrode understandings and cultural assumptions. We were coming from the outside and many of the people working on the project were from inside Kabul itself. And they had a fantastic local knowledge which they brought to the entire uh, rendition of the project. The site was well walked and well read because it was explained by many people to each other with their different viewpoints. Samples of materials and workmanship were the lingua franca of the, of the design and the ultimate build. Tea in the garden was a great leveller. The intention was to make an all embracing landscape for the public to accept as their own, albeit shared garden. A new intervention, part structure, part landscape, was an, an, an homage to the garden geometry of the past and the elevated expectations of the future. The green amphitheatre, which actually arose out of a pattern that had been in the original garden as flower beds and tree arcs. We were constantly reminded both on site and in the neighbourhood that whatever its history, the new park was now to be truly common ground for all ages. And we were constantly being approached by people from outside the park and around the park to actually find out what we were doing and why we were doing and when it was going to open. There were a great deal of uh, community excitement was generated. Our role in the park may have been a small one, but it was a privilege to participate in this project and with these people. And now a film. When all is said and done, city living is a shared experience. We all dream of a place in the sun in the morning and a place in the shade in the afternoon. Thank you from South Africa.
Um, I'd now like to introduce our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Le Soko Banseng. Um, thank you, Anthony. Um, hi, everyone. I'm very grateful for this opportunity to share um, some of my work with you. Um, right. So, Ula, right? Ula, which means rain, and land are intertwined elements of the Botswana cosmology. During gatherings, rain is the first point of departure. A speaker sanctifies the gathering by wishing rain upon the land. I will commence with the extractive parts of the study um, and then um, conclude with the catalytically experimental aspects. So um, the extraction of the study really stems from my grandmother's village, which is called Makhovistat in the Northwest. This place is the foundation of my existence, but it is a space that is frequently excluded from contemporary design thought. Um, the second part of the study, which is the application, occurs in a typical restituted farm in the Northwest, and I will explain restitution later. I treat this project as a story of migration and permanence. As we know, the Bantu, from which the Barlong in Makhobistat originate, were masters of migratory settlements. Migration was a self-preservation and environmental management tool used to survive the complex climate of the African continent, a perfected system. So what happened when permanent settlements took prevalence in Africa? In the Northwest province um, of South Africa, um, the permanence enforced upon initially migratory settlements um, has resulted in a lot of challenges. With the growing population and limited internal space for densification, a sprawl occurred um, which affected the initial planning of the settlement. Additionally, RDP housing, equivalent to social housing, was implemented in Makovistat. The development was not well received by the community and so numerous houses remain empty. But in this initial study, the focus is on the traditional settlements, which revolves around a secondary khotla, which I'll explain later. The settlement is typically um, situated and organized around the valley. Um, and additionally, the settlement is then broken down into two, which is a homestead close to the river, and then a farming stead type thing, which would be situated near the hills. Jean and James Kamaroff um, regard Makhovistat and the Barlong settlement typology as a result of a plural cosmology which has governed their entire tradition. This plurality begins in the Khotla. The Khotla is physically understood to be a circular enclosure defined by wooden logs where disputes are meant to be resolved. In the observations of this project, the physical is merely a re representation of the social networks and the hierarchies of the Batona society. According to Uzi Lenzwani, it highlights the importance of social cohesion within the Zwana tribe. This strive for social cohesion reiterates the, the tribe's intentional aim towards pluralism. Ideas about sustainability have prevailed in the settlement through the mystifying of sacred spaces, which are rivers and hills, and also assigning protection over totem animals. This is contrary to popular opinions that such typologies are random or organic. And so after rigorous uncovering and discovering the history and current hybrid strait of Makobistat, a few conclusions were drawn regarding its trajectory. First is that the residential settlement is defined by the central Kotla where the chief resides. Thereafter, the chief's migrant company establishes thresholds um, within which densification occurs. And we see that with the interruption of colonization, there is a sprawl that has occurred in Makovistat in a grid-like formation, 
which is influenced by nearby towns and formal roads. And thereafter, services are superimposed onto the settlement. The traditional layout ut utilizes accessible materials such as wood and mud, but also recycled materials such as glass and plastic. We start to see, even materialistically, the effects of a globally changing cosmology. We see a transition from shared space to individualized space. But cosmology is not the only change. The climate is also changing and the semi-arid area is feeling it the most. Drought after drought, the aquifer has dropped by five meters, meaning that boreholes now lie dormant and making getting water a struggle. The, na the nature of this village makes it susceptible to desertification. Livestock farming is a primary activity that causes overgrazing due to its format informality. Before, the community would migrate towards better conditions and allow the land to regain its strength. But, that, but as mentioned, this is no longer possible. Instead, the study proposes that the community implements migratory systems in their permanent settlements to manage the grazing of goats, who are the major culprits of overgrazing in the homesteads. This can be done through the usage of temporal fencing. The temporarily closed pastoral spaces will regain strength and prevent long-term effects of overgrazing and bare soil. So now moving over to the second part of the study, which focuses and resides in the intersection between heritage and climate change. Heritage informed by Makhobistat and climate in preparation for new sustainable settlements. The study has now leaped from Makhobistat, my grandmother, to back reef restitution, my children. <laughs> and so restitution means the restoration of something's lost or stolen to its proper owner. There were numerous farms restituted in 2009 in South Africa, and a lot of those failed to pick up due to the rules that come with restoration. In order to sustainably restore without setting communities out for failure, this is a third of a strategy proposed in the overall framework. And so the proposal is to first prioritize the protection of natural resources through it's going to be sand dams, stir lining, and a few other things proposed in the, in the framework. Secondly, to prepare sustainable, flexible farming systems through this temporarily, temporality and two-scale farming, both commercial and subsistence. And then thirdly, it's to give communities agency to develop contextually and uniquely through communally beneficial reuse of existing facilities and allowing for densification through negotiation of space. This will finally allow for the founding of innovative new settlements. So protecting natural resources can be done through an imported traditional method from similarly arid area called Burkina Faso. It is an accessible technology that can be implemented at both a macro and micro scale. The rocks are lined along contours to slow down runoff and increase infiltration with the long-term goal of replenishing the aquifer. In Makobi, trees are not merely planted. They are allowed to spring up where they're most comfortable to do so. And if this position and species please the homeowner, the plant will be protected to grow on its own. And so this is an inspiring concept for the proposal of the settlement, which is to utilize the existing foundations and source what is appropriate for our needs and then give agency for a unique and ever evolving cosmology. To conclude, I ask, is this landscape architecture Considering the Western narrative on outdoor spaces in Ar Africa, no, it isn't, but it should be. Thank you. So the next speaker was actually my supervisor for all that work. Um, this is Tana Klitzner.
to be a hundred. I'm not sure what. Uh. Tarna, your your speaker is not on. You're muted. Unmute. I'm terribly sorry. I'm happily chatting away. Um, I'll start again. Um, I'll share screen. Sorry, I'm terribly sorry. Um, firstly, thank you, Lisecha, and I will shall start again. Um, I want to start here. Okay, so I'm terribly sorry. So good evening. Thank you for inviting me to share the process and lessons we learned in the Harari Lynx project. As Gray mentioned in his introduction, this project is situated in Cape Town, South Africa. The program we worked within is the Violence Prevention Through Urban Upgrading Initiative, VPUU. VPUU is a non-profit organization funded by the German Development Bank. The VPU strategy is a bottom-up approach rooted within the communities they are working within. The hypothesis that they worked with is that through reclaiming the public domain and positively occupying dangerously labeled spaces, there will be a reduction in opportunities for crime. Through VPUU's baseline research of Metropolitan Cape Town, this is Metropolitan Cape Town, they identify the under-resourced townships in Cape Town with the highest crime rates. Kailicha was identified as the township in which VPU commenced their strategy, that is this area C, which is over here. The model they've developed is based on five spheres of intervention, all of which are founded on four foundational concepts of prevention, cohesion, protection, and research. We as the landscape architectural consultants were embedded within the situational crime leg um, of the project. However, we work closely with and were supported by the other four streams of the VPU strategy. The VPU construct within Kailicha is a partnership between the residents of Kailicha, the city of Cape Town and the German Development Bank. Kailicha is situated within the Cape Flats. It was developed during the early 1980s. Its location and layout is typical of apartheid planning separate development strategy, which utilized natural areas to separate, um, to separate and buffer zone the, the, the township from, from areas around it and to isolate and contain communities, as you can see here. There are natural areas all the way around Kailicha. The area we worked within is located across one of the one in a hundred year storm, um, storm overflow systems that bisects Kailicha. VPU worked with the community through a system of safe node area committees and street committees, doing door-to-door -door surveys and ground truthing over a period of two years. A series of crime maps were developed. This is an example of a crime map. Each one of these dots is a crime, a reported crime. So yellow is rape. Um, the mauve color is what was termed gangsterism. And then the turquoise color is abuse. It doesn't mean that these were all separate events that occurred, but it's how they remembered and how they were reported. What's important is the clustering of these dots and these, 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 these crimes. Um, so these identify areas where crime is most potentially up, will happen, and it's often opportune crime, and it's within this route that people took to walk to the station from their homes to the station. Initially, VPUU proposed the construction of a large building to house the various com community support programs required, for example, legal aid and aid support. Um, these they determined from their initial baseline studies. The community rejected this idea and identified that their need was for safer streets. Our role was to address the system of spaces that the community identified as an important route connecting the informal settlement in the south through the formal settlement across the stormwater 
system to Harare Station in the north. The context was a system of linking remnant landscapes no one owns and labelled unsafe by the community. Yet, on closer inspection, they occupy by community through informal trading and nurturing of the edges. We commenced with an area along this linear system, which had been identified in the community meetings as a potential children's park. It's the area with the white circle around it. Sited within the stormwater system, crisscrossed by pathways, it is a pedestrian route for scholars and workers accessing the station from early in the morning until after dark. With very little surveillance of the area from the surrounding homes, it had become a dumping ground and an undesirable environment. Our query as designers when entering this process of design within an environment unfamiliar to our experience and reference system is how do we access and hear what the community's needs and aspirations are to design built interventions that positively contribute to the community. The VPU strategy served as a construct we could work within, giving us access to the community and making us accessible to them through the community forum, street committees and community liaison offices. We worked in consultancy with the community. The use of a model encouraged interactive design and discussions. It was easy to remove bits and move them around. VPU's basis for these interventions is that they're required to be sustainable, socially, economically and environmentally once VPU are no longer engaged with the project. This means that the projects were to be owned by the community. Structuring elements that are rooted within the VPU methodology inform the design and making of the urban park. The principle of the promotion of safety as a public good was interpreted within the design in the following ways. The construction of visually clear, unobstructed routes through the spaces enables choice on entering the park, as a pedestrian can see who else is walking on the pathway, which allows them the opportunity to determine whether they feel safe entering the space. Definition of the edge, the boundary between the public and private realm. In our initial site visits to the site, we realized that the prevalent housing typology of adding on spaces for rental behind the housing units could result in contestations about boundaries and could intrude on the public realm if these were not clearly defined. The low boundary wall defines a clear recognizable edge between the private and the public realms. Multiple use spaces enabled the accommodation of shared stormwater detention areas as well as play areas within the park. Play courts have dual use as stormwater detention ponds, which gave us the opportunity to construct seating steps, plant rows and groups of trees for shade and create thick walls for trade, play and seating. Passive surveillance as crime prevention through encouraging and creating opportunities for access along this edge, which is highlighted in red, from the square onto the private properties with a hope that the neighboring homes will extend up to the edge and facilitate surveillance of the square. So that um, pattern of developing what we term backyard dwellers onto the back of houses was, it was um, sort of used to encourage people to enter from the square. So we built these um, boundary walls with openings in them so they could in time become the front entrances to the residences, to these backyard residences, which you can see starting to happen over here. Active boxes where the big red circle is. The locating of public buildings within the public space is this concept developed by, UP, by VPUU to ensure eyes on the street. These active boxes vary in size, but are always at least three floors high so that they are visible from and have visibility of the public routes. They are programmatically different within the different projects. They always have community spaces and a flatlet within them, which ensures a 24 hour presence on the public square. They are also, as you can see, the higher buildings to the sort of one story buildings that dominate the township. Integral to the square was the creation of safe places for children. We'd initially positioned play areas at both entrance exits. However, this is these circles. However, the community felt the play area that was not close to the active box, which is located here, would not have adequate surveillance and therefore was not considered to be safe. It was literally removed from the model when we, when we met and we discussed where these play spaces were going to go.
The use of unconventional play equipment created from salvaged alien vegetation was workshopped with the community and the crash principals, who were very positive about the explorative opportunities of the play structures. They enjoyed the fact that the children couldn't guess how to play until they'd started to play, so it became this explorative play. We also found we had to develop a very clear tree planting strategy as trees were not initially desired as they are perceived as dangerous elements as it is possible to hide behind them. Fortunately, in one of the workshops, a community member reminisced about the tree copses she grew up with in the rural area of the Eastern Cape, that's north of Cape Town. She particularly enjoyed the sound of birds in the trees and felt there was a possibility of recreating this environment in the urban context. This helped ameliorate the fear of trees and informed our thinking of tree placement. We didn't place groups of trees along the main routes, the main pedestrian routes, we placed them adjacent to them so you can choose to enter them if you wish. Visibility at night is crucial for the creation of safe spaces for pedestrians. <coughs> Excuse me. Closely spaced pedestrian scale post hop lights facilitate well lit areas at night. For more secure pedestrian movement, we spaced these lights at 10 meter centers, which is a very tight grid. Usually the street lighting is at 25 or 30 meter centers. We also installed high mass spotlights on the, sorry, on the play courts to facilitate extended use of the parks. You can see them here. So these were the primary structuring elements that formed the park. As part of our design brief, we were also required to ensure that the materiality of the elements we used in the park would enable the skills and training component of the EPUU strategy. So it's very much about skills transfer. The stone gliding along the walls and benches is constructed from calcrete, a stone found under the sands on the Cape Flats. The training of stone masons became one of the project's initiatives, as well as the training design and making of the tree cages. These tree cages were essential to stop the goats um, from eating the trees and the mosaics, an initiative engaging the artists in the community facilitated by the mosaic artist, Davil Friedman. It was also wonderful because here the children and the adults could participate in making these beautiful murals. What was once a neglected, dangerous space has become a well-lit active pedestrian and play space. So there were lessons learned. Through this participatory design, the team was able to transform a high crime area into sustainable, multifunctional public space. So the strategies I mentioned, which is the provision of clear definition between public and private space, provision of play space and relaxation place, creating safe, well lit surveyed pedestrian routes, use easy to maintain durable materials, embrace design strategies that engage and enable skills transfer, which was essential for it, the community's engagement and um, for them to benefit from the from the intervention as well. And the stewardship was fundamental in reducing vandalism and urban violence. So part of VPUU's um, strategy is also a, a very important leg was the evaluation of projects. And they were involved in this project from 2006 to 2014, were able to monitor it. So there was in the area a 30% increase in pedestrian movement and a 30% plus minus, well, actually more than that, but we work with a 30% decrease in violence um, in, in this area. So thank you very much. Um, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to share the project. And I'm sorry about my earlier glitch. Well, thank you uh, to our speakers. And uh, I think there's a few questions that Will, maybe you've picked up uh, that uh, people have been asking uh, on this uh, on the various projects. Uh, I think Anthony, there was a question for you um, around uh, security during the process, the construction process, and also who funded the project. Well, the the question that you're going to need to put your mic on, Anthony. <laughs> But the question, one of the questions was what type of security is required for designers? And this, this can extend to everyone for that matter. What type of security is required for designers and materials? And does the client provide the security during designing construction? Okay, yeah. The, uh, yes, indeed, the client actually supplied uh, more than adequate security 
uh, for the consultants on site and in and their living conditions because we went on trips of two or three weeks um, and there was no issue with um, insecurity on the site for materials because it was actually run in a very tight um, uh, a tight sort of organizational manner and obviously the curtain wall was built at the origin of the project so that actually secured the site uh, largely but as you saw in the pictures it was often permeable to ordinary people coming into the park simply to escape being in the street so but uh, security was never a, a, a pertinent issue on, on my visits to the to the uh, the country and the site. Uh, as to funding, um, it, like as for Tana's project, um, federal German funding came uh, forwards for the funding of the project in association with AKTC's own funding and cooperation with the Kabul municipality. So it was a sort of a joint a joint operation in that respect. And as I as I pointed out in the in the talk. The, the top up for ma maintenance and management. Often there's funds for building things, uh, construction, but there's not funds for maintaining and operating facilities. Um, and this occurs in, in, in parks all around the world, actually. And uh, in, in, in many parks or several parks in Africa and other parks in Asia, the, the, the idea of pet small, small fee pay to enter parks have actually worked, uh, worked very well. It really is based on whatever local people can afford. And, and visitors or tourists pay pay an additional sum, um, but it actually uh, enables uh, facilities to be maintained properly and to give the park a long a long life, rather than being a political exercise which is built one year and disappears over the next five years, which has often been the case in South Africa in the past, uh, where there was money to actually for for capital works, but never for maintenance. And obviously, landscape work really needs maintenance as much as anything. Is it, there is a question for Lisejo. Uh, do you find that the step of giving community agency over projects created is difficult to impose? Are community members always receptive to or equipped for this transition? Um, thank you for that question. Um, I think in the South African landscape, both in villages and informal settlements. Um, if we observe the extractive parts of the study where the traditional settlement was in compared to the social housing proposed, where we see that area sort of failing and there being a lot of spaces being neglected there, I guess we can learn from the Makhobisa project that actually from the traditional settlement where there is more negotiation, if there are resources available, that can actually make agency reinforce or make better settlements. So um, is, it is good to consider if the transition is good, but where, where there are resources, I think agency can happen um, as opposed to being overly prescriptive, which can be seen in RDP type of houses in South Africa that, especially in rural areas, that, that, that could potentially fail. We have a question for uh, Tarna. You have to unmute. Yeah, or sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, as I mentioned, um, thank you. I, as I'm, is it, so the question is about the funding of the project. So the it was a um, partnership between um, the German Development Bank and, um, as I said, the city of Cape Town. So the funding came from the German Development Bank, but the land was um, city land. So there was that relationship. And um, in terms of limited water, well, there's the aquifer. We did use a we did have a, a borehole which irrigates, which we use for irrigation. And then the idea is that water also is recharged through um, some parts of those um, detention basins when it does rain. So we and so we're using borehole and we um, yeah we recharging where we can. I just um, in terms of maintaining the vegetation it was also part of the project to train those local residents who were interested in looking after the landscape to look after and maintain, maintain the landscape. 
the issue of funding is an interesting one in terms of maintenance. There were initiatives that um, they tried to develop, but the city works with a, a general pool where, where money is gathered um, from rates, et cetera, go into a general pool, and it's not per area. But the idea was that in a similar way, I suppose, in a smaller way to what, what Anthony's saying, is that the buildings would generate some funds because they, the buildings have little community spaces within them the community can rent. So that money, the idea was that, that that money would go towards maintaining and paying people to maintain the landscape. I just want to talk about the security. Can I? Anthony's question. Because there was a very interest, it was very interesting on that site, and I think it really was because of the community participation that people bought into the project. Is that um, even during construction, as dangerous as it sounds, there was no fence around the property, and the um, the the contractor kept kept saying, "You're going to have to put a fence around this when we finished, because this is not going to last." And we kept saying to him, "No, no, this is." been designed in such a way and worked and designed with the community and, and um, in participation with the community that it will not be vandalized when we finished and things and the paving will still be here because the norm is that things can, can be taken and used elsewhere, sort of repurposed. And um, he, he didn't believe us, but the project is still there and it's very much because of that public participation and engagement with the community. So, um, so it sounds very similar to Anthony's project where people were playing on the fields even before, before it was finished. Well, um, I see there's a question asking about how, what's an effective method in getting communities involved in the project. And maybe I can just talk to that a little bit on my experience in the early days uh, in the Soweto in, in, in South Africa. Um, the Soweto is a township near Johannesburg. And um, in the early 2000s, when the government started funding parks in, in places like Soweto and townships, it, it was more about trying to get the community to accept the need for parks than anything else. Uh, uh, that was a major, a major effort because parks were always considered to be unsafe, as we saw in uh, Tana's presentation. And um, when people were, t were confronted with there's a possibility for a park to occur in this particular area. Often they would say, we don't want a park, we want houses and so, and so on and so forth. So in order to overcome that, there was extensive community engagement by going into the area, meeting with the people, getting ideas from them, taking these ideas, putting them down on paper, going back to them and explaining them uh, the, the ideas. And so on this process went backward and forward and iterated itself on a number of occasions until eventually uh, two things began to start happening. The community started to warm up to the idea of a park in the area and uh, secondly they were beginning to get quite excited about the potential for th that this had to give them work and that was one of the major issues that so the parks in the early days in Soweto where part of the process of going out to tender was to ensure that a, a good proportion of the project budget was allocated to employing people from the community who would then work on the project. And once people are working on the project and in the project, they begin to take ownership of it and stewardship begins to occur. So that was how we overcame. Um, it was a long process. It took us months and months to, to get to the point where people were accepting uh, of the fact that maybe this park is a good thing in their area. If, if I could just add something to the uh, the character of the parks in, in these sort of areas which are deprived of clean, green, uh, sort of safe open space, the park actually becomes a de facto garden for the entire community. And you see community uh, events, not only informal sports and religious holidays actually occur in, the, in these places uh, in, in South Africa and in, in Afghanistan. But you actually get very intimate family functions uh, like weddings and children's birthday parties which actually, they, they, they obviously live in crowded areas and to move out of the crowd to have a personal event is very special to them. And if there's large enough areas and they feel confident about it, uh, then these, you, you can tell because the number of photographs they take of these parks, they're always the background to everything. Every birthday, every wedding anniversary, you always see one of these parks in the background. So there's that sense of uh, belonging for the people and a sense of ownership 
uh, and it's it's very rewarding to actually see that and even even temporary events i mean life changes exhibitions come and go new things are developed so the park all parks actually in these circumstances need to be flexible to take on new ideas and abandon some old ideas it's very difficult to be regimented in these scenarios but um especially with these very young populations in developing countries all park design needs to be not not based in the 19th century but it needs to be based on a much broader field whatever the inherited landscape is is it needs to be sort of molded in a new manner there's uh, i have a question for all of you um the role the role that landscape um that language plays in the work that you are all doing i have to assume that there are many different languages that are spoken in south africa and when a landscape architect from uh, cape town or from pretoria or johannesburg comes in with a team, uh, what's the what is the challenge in terms of the languages, and also related to that, are there different roles that men and women play? And I assume the answer is yes. But what are these roles, and how do you experience them? Okay, who wants to to um, take a stab at that one? Uh, I can maybe uh, start with the the, the language issue. Um, well, the business language in South Africa is, is essentially English, but as soon as you move into the rural areas, uh, whatever has been said is translated into the local language. And so, um, uh, Lesejo, perhaps you can elaborate on, because your project took place in, 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 uh, in, in Tswana area, how, how did you engage with the community there? Yeah. Um, so when I was doing this project, that was a major aspect of why actually I did a project in the rural area is because um, of not only my own familiarity with the space, but also um, the ability to communicate and extract knowledge that is um, in my own language. And then the, yeah, so being able to receive knowledge through flyers that are written in the language spoken in rural areas, Sizwana, proved to be more important and it created sort of like a, a a relaxed environment and people shared things better with me because I could understand their own language. So I think that it's it's important in South Africa to, to know that sometimes language is a barrier in that a lot of things get lost in translation. But I think that <laughs> we do try our best with like translations and that but which is why it's important to have a lot more um black south african um landscape architects architects designers getting involved so that knowledge and the extraction of knowledge is quite intimate to people and yeah sometimes uh Lesejo, the concepts that we talk about and the language the jargon we use in landscape architecture is uh, is is lost on others how did you overcome that uh, in that environment where where were some of, did you still struggle with some of the ideas that you had trying to get it across to to the people because because it's conceptually it probably is quite different to the way they would see the world yes i think what helped in that regard is being able to illustrate um, so if you draw something out or you have images of things, I think just by the nature of being a landscape architect, the illustration of things assisted where language was a barrier. Mm. Okay. I, I, would, I would back that up, actually, yeah. um, exa exactly what you've just talked along the lines of. I've always identified English has spread largely around the world now, Africa and Asia, and that's very helpful, even if it's broken English from both sides. Um, drawings, you can't, drawings are the common lingua franca. They actually, they can sort out any situation, even mathematical situations can be sorted out by drawing, even the sim most simplistic drawings, and specifically not CAD, because I'm an old fashioned sort of person. And then we actually always resorted to building samples, A, because it allowed the artisans to actually involve you, you in their world and to show you and prove what they could do when you would, might be coming from a background where you might have never encountered that local material or never encountered that level of workmanship. 
so that was actually learning from both both in both directions and then last lastly what i was indicated in my talk was um by interacting with the uh, with the local people be they consultants or people in the park and actually uh, building a level of trust with them. And we found that was because we always ended up eating with them, whether it was kebabs in the park or whether it was some ricey mush uh, with, in, a, in a site meeting, by, by actually interacting socially with the people, even though we didn't speak the same language, there was a level of trust in the messages going in both directions. And that's irreplaceable. Yeah. Well, and um, I would, can I add to that? <laughs> I would just add model building. We found models indispensable because you can you can you can actually show um, what you're intending, and you can also move things around. So we found models useful. And in terms of language, I, I it is it is an issue. It's a very big issue because of the translation of what things mean as well. You know, and it was useful. Storytelling was useful. Found when the community started telling stories, especially related to trees and um, their experience of, of landscape, then one started to get a, a better insight and an understanding. So I think it's important to share stories and also to find um, methods of working, which was well, one was the model building and the other was, as Anthony said, the actual making of things. When we started making the tree cages, we worked with local um, sort of local welders actually and we just experimented with them and slowly developed what um, we needed. I think it's also an understanding of what the intention is. I always ask myself is what is the role of a landscape architect? Why are you there? And um, it's it's to listen. I think a lot of it is to listen and to to try and understand what the real issues are and then to help address those issues. Because sometimes what people are saying like we can't plant trees because they're dangerous that's not actually the issue. The tree is not the issue. Because um, they do actually want shade and do want places to sit and places to relax and, and places for recreation. So uh, it's listening. I think a lot of it is learning to listen and talk so less, actually. While, while you're on the, uh, on the up front, as it were, there's a very important question here, I think, uh, and that I'm sure many people are wondering about this. It is, uh, they want to know, is it possible to design to reduce crime? Is it actually possible or actually are you just maybe transferring the, Shifting the it. problem to another site? And has any research maybe been done through the VPUU yeah. project, first project to, to maybe help answer that question? Yeah, so that we always ask that. We ask, uh, we just shifted it, so we just nudged it sideways. I think the way we understand it really is that it's about opportune crime. It's not about the big planned crime. It's about um, somebody walking, let's say, with their handbag and somebody walking past and seeing no one can see, so I can grab that back. It's that kind of crime. So it's, um, it's, it's having surveillance. So it's more about the opportune crime than, than as I said, than planned or, um, or honing in on a shop or some, something bigger. So the sense is um, that it has reduced opportune crime. And also um, working with the community, communities are sooner prepared to report a crime or stop somebody from committing a crime once they feel empowered by it. Um, I think that it's all embedded in the legacy of not much trust with police in South Africa. So, um, so building up communities' um, sort of own ability to to care, to care and to and to take um, responsibility for that crime also makes a difference. But it, it very it is very much the opportune crime more more than um, than other kinds of crime. And having lighting makes a huge difference because um, people can't hide that easily. Does that answer right, that, Greg? Big pardon? Does that answer that? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, Will, do you want to uh, go ahead? Oh, well, I, I just wanted to add a, a piece of the question that I saw um, written down, and that is all of you have experience um, working, creating parks and places in dangerous areas and in areas that need your help. Um, 
have you do you go do you stick around afterwards to see if your design interventions um, have an effect on reducing crime and enhancing the communities in which you're working? I can can I just say very quickly I, I visit my projects a lot because people want to see them. So um, I do have this term I, I sort of won't just uh, take people to see projects. So won't just go into areas. So we um, so it's not voyeuristic. It's about really experiencing the, the place. So we've walked that Harari strip many times. There's so many more people walking there that you feel quite safe. Um, so that's been my experience. We do do revisit. I, I can only add that um, we've worked on one or two uh, waterfronts and seafronts, which were before they were renovated and restored. They were actually qu quite a lot of crime, petty crime, but nevertheless in in the areas. But it, once once you installed lighting and extended the safe use period of of, of the of the of the facility. And you attracted more people. So if there were concessions, food concessions, and the park was active, the peop the number of people using a particular area repelled the crime. It might have displaced it elsewhere. But so if, if a park is successful and attractive and maintained and, and, and people go there, they, it becomes self-policing to a certain degree. Yeah, I can concur with that. I think uh, one of the things, though, that one of the... Um, issues that we have here in South Africa with dealing in these kinds of places or working in these kinds of places is that it's not unheard of that your people out on site might experience crime. And uh, my office uh, had had that happen. That, uh, fortunately, it was what we would call petty crime, I suppose. But they were held up by knife and asked for cell phones and, and, uh, and had, to, had to hand them over. Um, we've also found a bit of a pattern that where, and it's almost directly re related, where communities for some reason um, take or, or have been involved more in the project, then the maintenance issues and the surveillance issues and the use issues in those parks uh, becomes important and they are the parks where less crime begins to start uh, happening. And um, but there are places where you've put parks in, and within months they literally back to square one. They are abandoned. People don't want to use them, and sometimes it's difficult to find out what it is that, that that's that's causing this. But there's definitely a strong correlation between involvement and um, in the original project and and the, the ongoing crime or deterioration of a place later on. Yeah. And I, yeah, I think that is also important to note, and I, I, I quote um, Elsa Wolf, who speaks about like our referencing the word community, and we have to be careful in that. We have to remember that South Africa as a whole is a dangerous place. I got mugged right outside in a state the other day. And so this is not something that is only in the types of projects that we do, but generally in the country, it's unsafe. So you're risking petty crime at any place in South Africa. So it's something, as a South African, you constantly have to navigate space having in your mind. Um, well, uh, I guess I'm waiting for Graham to put on his nightcap. Uh, I'm, I'm, I want to thank, I want to thank all of you, Tarna, Graham, Josejo, Anthony, uh, this is a really, it was a great pleasure to have you uh, in our midst, being able to bring your stories to us. And I know that our, certainly our, our public, our viewers are probably feeling the same thing. So I wanna thank you all. And I look forward to seeing you all again at um, some other time and in some other place. So thank you very much. And I want to thank everyone who helped out this evening as well. Lindsay, Miranda, and Leah. Thank you very much. Until the next time.